So let me do this question uh, from your old worksheet because I, I've i done similar question um, based on one of your homework questions and intended to help you with the pre-lab for actually next week's lab. And um, this is the, the question that we used to, well, we I guess in some sense still do, having the worksheet that we used to use in the in-person lecture. And it's intended to really uh, help uh, people prepare for that ballistic pendulum lab that you will be doing next week. So um, so let me just uh, go through this question quickly, uh, point out some of the things to uh, consider as you are considering this setup. So it says the picture on the right depicts the setup for the ballistic pendulum experiment. Like this is the exact drawing of what, you, well, uh, other than that, we don't use bullet, we use um, stainless steel ball. Uh, that's what I recommend that you use. Uh, we also have plastic ball. Um, projectile moving at some speed strikes a stationary projectile catcher and the catcher and the projectile swings up to some height. Okay, I'm not seeing that in the drawing, so let me just uh, uh, draw that second snapshot. So. Uh, and I think I should actually draw one additional snapshot. So, uh, moving at speed V, that's what's illustrated here. Now, when it strikes a stationary projectile catcher, that actually is another moment in time that might be good for us to have as a snapshot to refer to as we consider this setup. So, this whole thing is moving at some speed. Let me call it V1. And then it's describing they swing up to some height H. So I'm looking at these combined things, having swung up to some height, h. And I guess we are assuming at this height, uh, its speed is zero. At the very highest point, the speed would be zero. The masses of the projectile and the catcher are small m and big m. Uh, the initial velocity of the catcher, yeah, is at rest. Okay. So, Part A asks, is mechanical energy and total momentum conserved throughout this problem? And then if not, separate the problem into parts and so on. And so I think uh, last week with the conservation of energy, you could uh, rely on your intuition for the most part. And I believe I gave this criteria for when energy is conserved. Uh, to repeat, so energy is conserved when and th this is the most succinct way i can describe it every word here matters when no non-conservative force does net work uh, you only have two types of conservative forces so if, when we are talking about conservative force that's basically gravity and spring force um so so gravity and spring force doing work not a problem you can account for them in potential energy all other forces, normal force, um, tension force, applied force, friction force, they all are non-conservative force. So whenever any of those other forces do net work, that leads to non-conservation of mechanical energy. And whenever we talk about energy conservation, that's really what we mean because total energy is always conserved. So like talking about when is it conserved, it's like asking on which day will sun rise? every day so um, so um now with this criterion and your intuition you could tell most of the times when energy is conserved last week and this week for example to figure out that this collision process didn't conserve energy if that statement surprised you to know that, um, you have to be familiar with the different types of collisions. And I'll talk about that in a bit, uh, after talking about um, the condition for when momentum is conserved. So, so we'll look back to the conservation of energy in the entire process in a bit. For momentum, I can make a similar statement about conservation of momentum. And there are, so let me, as I make that similar statement, let me highlight the differences. So momentum is conserved when no, and then there's some particular type of force that I'm worried about. And this time it's not conservative, non-conservative force I'm worried about. I'm worried about external force when no external force imparts net impulse. So 
if for some reason um so the the opposite of external force would be internal force so if all the forces present on a particular body is internal force as in it's a force within other parts of the system then internal forces you don't worry about uh, because of newton's third law any uh, impulse which leads to change of momentum um, due to internal force just gets cancelled out so uh, the, no internal force can change the momentum of the entire system now you might have situations where you have external force like situations where you have for example friction with the road or situations where you have gravity and normal force like actually this particular the process that's happening here um, in this uh, throughout this whole setup um, you have two external forces you have gravity pulling things down you have tension force uh, supporting it up and um, I would say those two external forces we don't have to worry about for two reasons. One is that those two external forces, gravity, mg, and tension force upward, they balance each other out. So it's a zero net force. So when you are looking at net impulse, it'll be zero for that one reason. And um, suppose somehow we didn't have tension force in a setup. I would still not worry about gravity. And that goes to the definition of an impulse. Impulse is defined as a force times the duration of time. And um, when you are looking at collisions, and I'll talk about types of collisions in a bit. <laughs> when you are looking at collisions, especially if you can look at it as a process happening over a very short amount of time, and you have a finite external force like gravity, then the, that finite external force can uh, be imparting a negligible impulse. So even if this was like a free, free hang, um, uh, well, free falling block, I would still feel like okay, let's ignore gravity because it's imparting negligible impulse. So, uh, and I guess with all the different uh, situations that could have come up in conservation of energy and momentum situations, especially with the collisions, what I would say is uh, practice makes perfect. And as you are practicing, uh, it's good to be aware of the different types of collisions. So let me just spell out some, um, well, um, three types of collisions that you can tell uh, either be, uh, based on wording or different a uh, way situations are presented. So three types, it's not really three, but I, I like to think of it as three. Three types of collisions. The first and the easiest type to identify would be, I guess, elastic collision. Elastic collision is where kinetic energy is conserved. And you will be able to tell from um, different um, um, hints in the problem or setup. Problem might tell you it's an elastic collision or it might indicate one way or another that somehow kinetic energy is conserved. If you have that, then great. You have elastic collision. You can and should use conservation of energy. The second type is inelastic collision. And um, I guess when you have inelastic collision, the biggest thing is you cannot use conservation of energy. So uh, situations involving inelastic collision uh, tends to give you additional pieces of information because um, you kind of need those additional pieces of information about like post-collision velocities and whatnot in order to be able to work out the problem. And the third type, which some people might lump in with the number two, but I separate out as a, a third thing because sometimes this is indicated in different ways. I would call it, or it's called completely inelastic collision. This is the collision where, I guess the way to describe it is, you have lost the most amount of kinetic energy as possible. It wouldn't necessarily be all the kinetic energy, because in collisions, whenever you are dealing with the collisions, here's one thing to be aware of. In almost all the collisions, like 99% of them, momentum is conserved. And the way momentum is conserved is really happening through delta t being small. So in most cases, you can ignore external forces, unless it's like collision of a ball with a wall, then 
All right. Um, that's the type that involves type of force that will increase to infinity as a delta t goes to zero. So, um, so because momentum is conserved in collisions, in a completely inelastic collision, you will still have the constraint. And within the constraint, you lose the most amount of kinetic energy possible. And the way that happens is the situation you see here, uh, where the the projectile strikes the projectile catcher, and I think this is a tricky one. It doesn't even actually tell you uh, in a, like a black and white letter. It just you know says it strikes a stationary projectile catcher, and you have to have this mental image in mind where the projectile is embedded within the catcher, and um, in some sense they are now stuck together. And the way completely inelastic collision happens, you will always see this, and sometimes it's called sticking collision. So whenever you see two objects colliding and sticking, you have to immediately realize that that types of collision does not conserve energy. In fact, it loses the most amount of kinetic energy possible. So based on that, um, you would say, okay, mechanical energy is not conserved in this part of the process. In the very first collision, no conservation of energy, but you still have conservation of momentum, and that should still give you enough information to work out, for example, what is V1. You should still be able to figure that out. Okay, so um, so energy conservation is gone. <laughs> um, and... Um, so could we say then the total momentum is conserved throughout this problem? I, I hope you can see that as you look at this final state that, uh, oh, uh, at some point the momentum isn't conserved because you start out with some momentum and then you end with zero momentum. So there was a process that didn't conserve momentum. And that's the part where this swing up happened. Um, as this whole thing is swinging up, now the amount of time is fairly large and you have this continuous um, application of the tension force along with the gravity. And um, so other than in this exact position, the tension force and the gravity don't exactly balance each other out. So the those net external force will end up imparting a non-zero net impulse and um, change your momentum. So, so in the second part, your total momentum is not conserved. So, so that's where you have to do what the part second part of part A says. You know, if not, separate the problem into separate parts where in each part, mechanical energy and or momentum is conserved. And for this part, it'll be uh, in one part, momentum is, will be conserved and nothing else, uh, or you know, momentum and not energy. And the other part, it'll be. Um, Energy is conserved and momentum is not conserved. So let me just sketch out those two parts. So the very first part, collision, um, momentum is conserved. And I'll just briefly sketch the process. We are starting with some um, initial state where I had a bullet uh, projectile moving at speed V. So from that state to the state where you have the uh, catcher and the projectile stuck in it, both together moving at V1. Um, so, so going from this snapshot, let me call it 1, to this snapshot, let me call that, oh, that's going to be so confusing, okay. Uh, let me call the first snapshot 0 and call this snapshot 1 so that that one matches this one. Um, so from here to here, momentum is conserved. And energy is not conserved. That's the sticking collision part that you have to know from experience, from my description right now. And after that, uh, you have a second process that leads to the uh, the catcher being at some height. That'll be uh, where now energy is conserved. So from this snapshot, so I think this is still the same snapshot one. So I'm drawing the things on the top. It's moving at speed V1. So, you know, it's a still the snapshot one. So going from the snapshot one to snapshot two, where it's now at some height, H. And this is where you can go through this criterion again. During this uh, swing up, 
reaching this snapshot too, you know, so energy is conserved when no non-conservative force does not work. Uh, during this entire swing up, if air resistance is negligible, then you have tension force, gravity. Gravity is conservative force, I don't worry about it. So tension force could potentially cause an issue. But as you consider it carefully, you know, tension force is in this direction there, tension force is in this direction there. I hope you can figure out that the displacement, the delta x, is always kind of perpendicular to the tension force. So tension force won't be doing any work. That's the typical situation with the tension and normal force. Even though they are non-conservative, they tend to be perpendicular to the um, displacement direction. So they usually don't do any work. So they usually are kind of associated with the situations where energy is conserved. And this is one of them. So, so yeah, those are the two parts you have to separate it into. So th this part, they took a lot of time and it's kind of like a drawing free body diagram in standard strategy. It, this is the part that takes a lot of care to make sure that you don't make mistakes, that you have clearly sketch, um, your, you have a clear mental image of the setup. Once you have that, the rest of the question is really easy. Oh, I think I actually did the B as well for each part. Yeah, I, I did that explanation as I was going. So let me not labor over that part to be, which I kind of answered. So now the rest of the question is actually real easy. So part C asks, uh, find an expression V for the speed of the projectile in terms of the following measurable quantities. Oh, it's not doing anything to separate the question out into parts. So I will do that separation part. So the separation part. So, uh, you know, it go, so this is the biggest mistake that, or not biggest, most common mistake that people make. Because you see, you know, okay, height is given, and I want to find the speed of the projectile. So people kind of try to do this entire thing in one step. You do, okay, with this height, I know my potential energy as snapshot two, that's gonna be equal to the total mass, m plus m g h and you want to say okay that's gonna be equal to my kinetic energy in snapshot zero which is gonna be equal to one half mv squared you see there's only one unknown uh, everything else is known and you solve for that you get v is equal to square root of two um the sum of the masses divided by small mass G H and you think you are done. And I will tell you that is wrong. Wrong. <laughs> That's why you know there was part A and B. Because um, in order for this equation to work, you need to be able to say from snapshot zero to two, the entire process energy is conserved, and we just talked about how that doesn't happen. So you need to separate it out. Really, um, if we are kind of working backward, starting from the quantity that we are trying to figure out, the farthest back you can go is to this picture, snapshot one, where you have an expression for V1. So, so let me write it down. And after I do that, then uh, we'll have some idea of where to go to find the remaining unknown. So let me uh, write down the correct expression for, uh, so I'm using conservation of energy so I'm starting out with my conservation statement, total energy in snapshot two, where I have some unknowns I'm trying to find, is equal to the total energy in snapshot one, where I may have some parameters that um, I can um, involve with the H. So in snapshot two, kinetic energy is zero, so I'm just gonna say um, all potential energy. Um, so I have uh, potential energy in snapshot two, plus zero kinetic energy is equal to total energy in snapshot one. Um, so you will have kinetic energy here because of V1. So I have kinetic energy one. And uh, to be careful, I should say plus the potential energy at one. Um, but what you really should do at this stage is uh, make this explicit. Explicitly say that the height of the cart in snapshot one, I'm gonna say that's where my Y equals zero. Um, so uh, under that convention, I can say my potential energy is set to be zero at, um, at the snapshot one. 
um, and just proceed from that. If y is not equal to zero there, then for potential energy snapshot two, you'll have to use like y plus h and y overcomplicate when you don't have to. So with that, let's write the next uh, uh, and the final equation before I can try to solve it. So the potential energy in snapshot two, that's just gravitational potential energy, the sum of the masses times gh, hopefully remember the gravitational potential energy formula that was derived in the textbook and lecture. That's equal to the kinetic energy at the beginning. It's still the combined masses, so it'll be one half the combined masses times their combined well, or common speed squared. So I have some simplification, the masses cancel out. And um, so if I wanted to solve for H, I could solve for H. Say H is equal to um, V1 squared over 2G. The only problem with this as an answer, or actually I'm not even solving for H, so that was pointless. <laughs> but anyways, uh, um, uh, the uh, problem here would be, well, um, um, well, one, I'm solving for something that that's measured and known. Um, so I could, could do the other thing and solve for V1. So if I solve for V1, then it'll be V1 is equal to square root of 2GH. And after you find the V1, uh, that's not what we are looking for. We are looking for the speed of the projectile. And, um, and the V1 is not speed of the projectile. So we are not done. And this is where um, we've gone as far as we could with uh, snapshots 2 and 1. And now you have to piece together the remaining piece and go from snapshot 1 to snapshot 0 to eventually get to speed of the projectile. So for that part, um, we are using conservation of momentum. So uh, so uh, this is where um, it's, uh, last week was easy because last week, if anything was going to be conserved, it was going to be energy. Uh, this week and on, you have to kind of make the decisions, you know, what's going to be conserved and now. Momentum will be conserved. So I'm going to say conservation of momentum. And once you identify the quantity that you think will be conserved, then the rest of the steps are kind of the same as what I've gone through here. I start by identifying the two snapshots that I'm going to use and say, the OK, the total momentum in snapshot one is going to be equal to the total momentum in snapshot zero and I write out all the things that contribute to momentum. In snapshot one, I'm gonna just treat the whole thing as one thing. So it'll be the total mass times the, com the common speed, V1, is equal to the total initial momentum where, oh, I didn't draw the cart, but the cart had, catcher had a zero momentum, so it's gonna be just momentum of the projectile. Small m times V, and if you want, you know, plus zero for the uh, catcher that didn't have any momentum. So in this equation, I can solve for V in terms of V1. So when I do that, I get V is equal to the sum of the masses divided by the small mass times V1. And this is a kind of an easy system of equations because I could solve for V1 in terms of all the other known things. Now I can just plug it in here. So I can say my V is equal to the this ratio times square root of 2gh. That is the answer for speed of the projectile in terms of the other quantities that can be measured. Now, once you have this, I think it's uh, instructive to compare this with the, um, the other answer that was wrong. When you compare it, you see quite a bit of similarities. Because, you know, this uh, correct answer has a square root of 2gh. The incorrect answer also had the square root of 2gh. So the only difference between the two is how this ratio of the masses is treated. In this common incorrect answer, that's a square rooted. But in the real correct answer, that's not square rooted, just there. And that leads to a little bit of difference. So I guess uh, um, the, this incorrect answer, I think, uh, overestimates the initial speed because um, this ratio is over, no, sorry, underestimate, because this ratio is a ratio bigger than one, and when you square root it, it becomes a smaller. Um, so 
when you correctly account for the fact that in the collision energy is lost, then the initial speed must have been greater to lead to some height that you end up measuring. Okay, uh, and I think, uh, yeah, let's do this last part. Um, so, you know, it says optional needed for lab. <laughs> um, and uh, for the lab, you will see, oh, yeah, so in, uh, in the lab, what you do is you're going to move the launcher onto some ledge somewhere. And so the ball will be launched with uh, hopefully the same speed as the speed that uh, we were measuring with the, the uh, ballistic pendulum. And uh, we'll just be doing a projectile motion thing. Because uh, with the projectile motion, uh, so using only rollers, uh, so what you can measure is this range and the height. Only rollers, no, no time measurement. And... Um, Using only these, you can figure out the velocity. So, uh, so let me give it a try. It will be a good um, kind of projectile motion um, uh, review <laughs> refresher. So, whenever you are dealing with the projectile motion, the number one thing I would do to start with is let's break stuff into uh, x and y components. Those are two independent, by independent I mean perpendicular, independent directions of motion and um, whatever is happening in the x direction is independent of y, but they are connected to each other through the uh, common time. So usually the y component of motion is useful in telling me the amount of time which I can relate to stuff happening in the x direction. So let me write down some of the kinematics equations that I think uh, I will need. So the y direction. Um, so, so y position equation, I'll be saying uh, my five. So let's uh, treat it as a final. That's where the ball will end. So my y final, which will be zero, is going to be given by this um, kinematics formula that you hopefully either remember or know where to look up. Minus one half acceleration g uh, time final squared. Plus, it should be V initial times time final, but initial Y velocity here was zero if you fire the projectile horizontally, so it's going to be zero. Plus my initial height, which was H, uh, different H. Let me use a capital H for this so it doesn't get confused with the other H. Uh, so that initial height, H. So that's one equation. Uh, zero is equal to all that. And I think I can imagine solving this for t final. Everything else is known here. Uh, so let me let me do that. So solving this for t final, uh, I'm just going to do this in my head. You can pause the video or uh, double check me in, in your own time. <laughs> let me just do this in my head because <laughs> it's quicker. 2h divided by g square rooted. The, I'm just going to check the unit. This is in meters, meter per second square, so meters cancel. I have 1 over 1 over second square, which will give me second square. Square root it, that's in seconds. Okay, I don't think I made any algebra error. So with the t final, I can see, oh, I can get range pretty easily because range is just going to be my horizontal velocity, which is v times t final. So if I just plug it in that t final there, the equation I get will be range is equal to the that launch speed times square root of 2h over g. And what we actually want isn't the range. You will be measuring range. So you just solve for v. So solving for v, I get v is equal to range times the square root of g over 2h. So that's uh, this independent method that you could use to measure the, the launch speed of that launcher in lab. And uh, you compare that with the ballistic pendulum method. And hopefully they agree with each other within 10% and will give you confidence that mechanics works. Um, maybe. <laughs> At least that's the hope. Um, yeah. All right. So that was long, but um, well, yeah. If, if, uh, uh, I'll try to edit it down, and if uh, it's something terrible, then I don't have to use it. <laughs> so, 